America is a land of many religions. It takes pride in the freedom it gives people to worship their own God in their own way. Sheltered by such freedoms, different strands of Christianity have developed from the faith brought originally from Europe. The Shakers, for example, Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Christian Scientists. This is a story of a Christian scientist family who followed their faith to the letter and in so doing ended up in court charged with manslaughter. It happened here in Boston, the very city from which Christian science first began and where what's called its mother church stands. The term mother church is appropriate for Christian science was founded by a woman. On April the 3rd, 1986, in this house, two-year-old Robin Twitchell fell ill. Five days later, Robin died of what proved to be an obstruction of the bowel. His parents, David and Ginger Twitchell, had at no time called a doctor, believing that as Christian scientists who believe in prayer and not in medicine, their rights were guaranteed under American law. That right was challenged in July 1990, when the Twitchells were put on trial for manslaughter and found guilty. What lies at the heart of the matter is whether the freedom to follow the teachings of a recognized religion should allow parents the right to refuse medical care when the lives of their children seem threatened. When Robin woke in pain in the middle of the night, David and Ginger Twitchell were ignorant of what his symptoms might mean medically. They believed he might have flu. When Robin was sick, they prayed. When he ceased to vomit, they believed this could mean that spiritual healing was beginning. Christian scientists believe illness and disease are evidence of impurity, alienation from God, and that their prayers can restore harmony to the body. David and Ginger had been brought up in that belief, so had their parents before them. Robin's illness was to last for five days and five nights. Throughout that time, he sometimes looked bright enough to convince them their method of healing was in progress. They never considered that his life was in danger. David's testimony in court said that Robin had only complained of severe pain on the first day. Children are very able to show pain or say pain one way or another. Uh, he didn't give indications of pain after that again until the night he died. For me, uh, if the child's coughing, it's life-threatening in the sense of it threatens the balance of life. It's something that's not a right part of that child. And that's the way I approach everything in life, anything that is not harmonious and loving and good the way God would want it, the way God's creation was. He saw all things that he had made and they were very good. Anything that's not like that, especially with our children, is something that needs to be corrected. Their faith in healing is the very essence of Christian science. Its followers believe Christ's mission on earth was to heal. They refer constantly to the cures he wrought. So when Christian scientists fall ill, they call in a Christian science practitioner, a specialist in prayer, who after just two weeks training is considered qualified in spiritual healing. They can be consulted over the phone. They advertise in Christian science publications and take a fee for their services. If the illness persists, a Christian science nurse can attend, merely to give physical care, not medical help. Even such practitioners and nurses have no knowledge or training in orthodox biology or even anatomy. Anatomy in, uh, uh, to a Christian science practitioner is very different than from a medical practitioner. The anatomy of, of man as his spiritual being comes to play. Um, the uh, completeness and the wholeness uh, in the way that God made him, uh, yes, there is anatomy, but not the physical body. We do not turn to that to define man totally. Friday morning, uh after I'd gone to work, Ginger called a practitioner, and that practitioner helped us throughout Robin's problem. We were in contact with her regularly, and she came and visited a number of times. And what did she say? Like us, uh, and even more so, her focus is prayer and 
healing a situation or a problem, whatever it is, through prayer. And so she prayed aloud with Robin. She also just spent some personal time with him, hopefully as a doctor or a nurse could with a child, uh, just loving them and being a nice person with them. Did it ever cross anyone's mind at any point just to phone a doctor? We are not against calling medical doctor. It's just that what I've been taught and what I've experienced is that you know that turning to prayer turning to god is a better more complete and more thorough healing of a problem solution to a problem than turning to other systems the church of christ scientist was founded late in the last century by mary baker eddy a woman whose resolute character prevailed over an early life of persistently frail health. It has grown to be a worldwide church now active in 68 countries. It has some 200 churches in the British Isles. But it began in 1866 when at the age of 45, Mary Baker Eddy fell in an icy street of her hometown Lynn near Boston and received what reports refer to as serious internal injuries. As she lay ill, sustained by biblical texts, she discovered the system she called Christian Science. It said she recovered instantly. Her book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, was published ten years later. It stands with the Bible itself, the twin texts of Christian Science. The case of David and Ginger Twitchell is seen now by Christian scientists as putting their religion on trial. Nathan Talbot, seen here on the right, is a leading Christian Science spokesman. It really was a trial that, at the heart of it, dealt with, with society and religion and where spiritual healing fits in to individual lives. While most people would see a drug therapy, for instance, as the mode of treatment and then look to God as a source of comfort during the mode of treatment, the Christian scientist sees prayer itself as the mode of treatment, not only as a mode of treatment, but as a mode of treatment that can be con um, really relied on with consistency, with consistent healing results. The death of a child is a terrible loss. Did you yourself feel that your God had failed you? I've never felt that God had failed. He's perfect. Uh, any failure would be in, for me, in my understanding him and trusting him and being closer to him. If I didn't think prayer was the better solution, if I didn't think that it was safer for my children and myself, but particularly for my children, I'd turn to medicine. If it was mind over matter in the general sense of the term, well, mind over matter is great support when you're working with a doctor. I strongly believe that just plain mind over matter or just uh, you know, right thinking and being positive can do a great deal for helping with a healing. But you better have a doctor along with it, at least for something other than just a psychosomatic difficulty. Uh, but so it's a matter of I wouldn't trust my children to something that was second best. Six months after Robin Twitchell's death, the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office ordered an inquest. The Twitchells, their practitioner, nurse and representatives of the church all gave evidence. A year later, the inquest judge decided there was a case to answer. In April this year, in Boston's courtroom, the Twitchells pleaded not guilty to involuntary manslaughter and their defence lawyer, Ricky Kleeman, put as their main defence that the child had not seemed to its parents in any danger. These parents did not choose or think or consider about martyring their child. They didn't think about sacrificing their child. They didn't think that one day they would meet their child in heaven and therefore martyr their child. They loved their child. He was their son. The Twitchell soy child who exhibited symptoms that looked like, at worst, at worst, the flu. Um, he had a bellyache. 
Then there didn't seem to be any more symptoms of pain. There was no fever. There was no diarrhea. There was no bleeding. Um, what he had was he vomited one morning. He had a good day the next day. He played with other children that day. Then he had fitful sleep, vomited again on another day, um, then seemed to get a little better, vomited again on another day, then seemed to get not only a better, but seemed to be on the last day completely healed. So when the child in the last hours of his life took this dramatic, sudden turn for the worse, it was a shock to the Twitchells, and the Twitchells did what they thought they should do, which is they once again called their practitioner, not a doctor. What we know from the pathology report is that the child suffered uh, an intestinal twist called a volvulus. And although for the first few days that twist might have gone on and off and on and off, towards the end, uh, at least probably for about 36 hours prior to the child's demise, it, the twist was probably in and there, and the child was probably suffering uh, severe cramps, um, frequent vomiting, if not almost continuous vomiting, vomiting of material that should have seemed like stool or feces. It's quite clear the child must have been uh, suffering tremendously towards the end, and perhaps the reassurance they were getting from those around them was enough for them to deny how sick the child was. We see denial in parents of very sick children all the time, and um, I think their inability to accept the possibility of the child's death um, in the face of spiritual healing may have allowed them to deny how ill the child really was. Can it be effective, spiritual healing? Well, I think spiritual healing happens all the time. I think that when you cut yourself and that cut heals, that has to be viewed virtually on a religious level. The way the human body has been put together is certainly a, a tremendous achievement that, that seems to carry with it some almost supernatural properties. However, there are illnesses for which spiritual healing will not work, simply because spiritual healing can't go in there and untwist a bowel once it's been twisted to the extent that it is now going to die. Um, and miracles happen, but miracles don't necessarily happen when you wish them to happen. Prosecutor John Kernan argued that the very act of repeatedly calling on their practitioner showed the Twitchells had indeed been aware that Robin's health was increasingly a cause for concern and that his care rested with them. He looked to the source of his care, his nurturing, his warmth, his love, his food, his shelter, his clothing, and his care. And he had a name for his God. And the name for his God was mother and father. And his mother and father abandoned him. If your child is vomiting his own excrement, uh, wouldn't you think that that child was at grave risk? A child who's screaming, who's clutching at his belly? Isn't that child at grave risk? Somebody who hasn't slept, eaten for five days, whose parents move into a small room to sleep next to him, obviously indicating a recognition that the child is seriously ill. Everything that they did uh, was an acknowledgement, a recognition that the child was seriously ill. Calling in all the help, the nurse, the practitioner, the committee on publication, the church official, um, all the signs and symptoms, they recognized the child was seriously ill. You say that David Twitchell believed that spiritual healing was the best method for his child. There's no question about that in my mind. He believed it, yes, but he wasn't right. Well, we don't know he wasn't right. Um, Robin Twitchell died, and, and if you want to say, well, Robin died, therefore spiritual healing was not the best method of care, you would also have to say the child who gets taken to the hospital with a bowel obstruction and dies for any variety of reasons, the anesthesia doesn't work, the surgery is not successful, um, septic shock sets in, uh, the child um, has cardiac arrest on the table, that if that child died in the hospital, you can't look at that death and then go back and say, well, the parents who chose medical care weren't right. Um, and that's, that's always the problem with these cases. But surely David Twitchell's distress throughout the trial bore testimony to the sincerity of his faith and his trust in spiritual healing. You didn't consider calling in a doctor, did you? I just know how much it hurt. I don't know what I was thinking does appear to have a, a sense of sincerity about him. Um, but before I jump to that conclusion, I'd ask 
uh, why is it that uh, when he is confronted with a, a medical problem, a toothache, he goes to the dentist and receives Novocaine to kill the pain, and yet he denies that obvious medical procedure to his son? Why is it that Mrs. Twitchell, uh, when treated during the course of the birth of young Robin, received Xylocaine, which is a, uh, uh, a pain-killing drug, an anesthetic, and stitches? Why can she avail herself of medical procedures and drugs and deny it to her son? So that I question the use of sincerity. Um, and in addition to that, I, I again suggest it is not the subjective analysis of Mr. and Mrs. Twitchell, but it's the objective standard to which we're all held, to protect and preserve the rights of children. Another story, that of Mark Converse, whom I talked to, closely parallels that of the Twitchells. Mark comes from a Christian science family. His wife, Pat, was a convert. Today, they have two healthy children, Christopher now eight and Brittany aged six. But when Christopher was two months old, he was struck down by exactly the same ailment as Robin Twitchell, a constricted bowel. Accordingly, Mark and Pat prayed. They called in a practitioner, but Christopher didn't improve. It uh, began to scare me a little bit. So I again called the practitioner, and one of the conversations that he had, we had with him, he said, uh, you know, I wonder if you have really done the preparation work that you should have done before the birth of the child. Have you really done the prayerful work about birth and what a child of God is and things like that? So I began to feel a sense of personal guilt about it, that really the reason my son was ill was because something in my thinking or possibly something in my wife's thinking, we didn't know. I was afraid the child was going to die, and I'd never been confronted with something like that before. So we sat there a while and thought about it, and finally uh, I said, listen, I think I ought to call a doctor. So we called a doc I called a doctor, I called him up, and I said, my son's been vomiting. And uh, I said, well, I just, I don't know how serious it is. So he said, I'd take him to the emergency room. So my wife didn't go. She was going to stay home and pray. And I put the child in the car, take him to the emergency room. I was waiting in the room, in my son's room. And the nurse came in and said, uh, we're going to have to operate on your son. And it really hit me. I thought, oh boy, what am I going to do now? Uh, they want to operate. I'm, I haven't been around doctors and physicians. I haven't been in hospitals that much. I don't know what to expect. I felt a tremendous amount of guilt that I'd some way failed in my religion. I said, I think my son's going to be okay. I'm going to take him home. And he said to me, I, he said, uh, he said, do you want your son to die? You know, and I just, no one's ever said anything like that to me before, you know. Do you want your son to die? And, uh, and I said, no. Mark Converse had, in the crisis of the moment, made an independent decision. David Twitchell, by contrast, was surrounded with other Christian scientists, the practitioner, the nurse, who reaffirmed his faith. But what is the nature of a faith that can so profoundly convince its followers to resist the help offered by medicine? The question that matters is, does spiritual healing work, and where is the evidence? So far, no objective study has been done. Until the Twitchell case, the evidence was largely anecdotal, from the unchecked testimonials of believers at church services. Since then, the church has begun making an effort to offer more scientific proof, though for believers, faith doesn't need proof. And we're being forced to pull together evidence of Christian science healing, which is happening. Uh, we've recently done a study that has discussed some 2,300 cases that were medically diagnosed, cases that range from gangrene to blindness to glaucoma, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, meningitis, cancer, and so on and so forth that were healed after a medical diagnosis under Christian science treatment. They must be able as individuals to sustain an enormous amount of physical suffering if they have ailments that they don't treat. Oh, you can bet. Uh, I've known Christian scientists with all types of illnesses, uh, illnesses on their diseases of their hands where they'll, where they'll cover their hands with gloves. Uh, they may have something on their face or a growth that'll take the mirrors out of their room, out of their house, so they, so they don't see it anymore. You just have to deny that material picture of illness in any way you can. Are you allowed painkillers in such situations? No, none at all. So many times I've heard people say, 
well, you, you could take an aspirin. And I'd say, no way. Christian Science would never take an aspirin. They'd never take a temperature. They'd never put a cold rag on a child's head that was hot. Once you do that, see, you're, you're, you're admitting that there's something to heal. And the more you recognize that, the more difficult it is to heal. To anyone outside the church and its beliefs, and even to anyone who dislikes the impersonal tone of high-tech medicine, one question is obvious. Why not use both medicine and prayer together? I am amazed with what authority I have heard this uh, suggestion given that you can pray and have medical attention at the same time. Um, it also uh, is presented as if it were a new answer when actually this has been happening or tried for many centuries. In fact, Christ Jesus had to address this very problem, but he answered it by saying, you cannot serve two masters. Our teachings very strongly indicate that if you are trying to use prayer to heal a specific problem and trying to use medicine to heal a specific problem, they're liable to negate each other, and you're worse off than using all of one or all of the other. All right. In the course of the trial, Judge Sandra Hamlin made a crucial intervention. A Massachusetts law passed in 1971 says a child shall not be deemed neglected if it receives spiritual healing alone from a recognized church. The Twitchells and all Christian scientists believe this means they cannot be prosecuted under child neglect statutes. But Judge Hamlin refused to instruct the jury about the 1971 law. Instead, she gave her own interpretation of it. The reliance on spiritual healing alone in other words, the exclusive reliance on spiritual healing alone, without medical care, may not be permitted if under the circumstances the child was exposed to the risk of serious bodily injury or death. The judge refused to have the law read to the jury. She refused to instruct the jury uh, about the law. And the, the only thing that she let the jury know was that spiritual healing is permitted in Massachusetts but not in the case of a child with a serious illness. Now, there is nowhere that the law says that. Her words are not what the law says. So the jury was really deprived of knowing that the Twitchells thought everything they did was perfectly legal. The Twitchell trial lasted two months. The jury, four men and eight women, deliberated for almost two whole days. Finally, their verdict, guilty. Members of the jury, have you agreed upon your verdicts? The charge is David R. Uh, Twitchell, Ginger Twitchell, with manslaughter, guilty or not guilty? Guilty. The news made a big splash. News reporters and television teams sought out comments from all those involved. In Boston especially, it was headline news. Only at this point did the jury learn about the 1971 Act and the protection it gives to Christian sons under the child abuse statutes. In fact, the Twitchell prosecution for manslaughter had been made under the criminal code. Christine Dickinson, a juror who'd been particularly distressed when she'd voted the Twitchells guilty, then went public with her protest in a leading Boston magazine. I think it's important for jurors to come forward if they have a problem after the verdict because that's what this country is about. It's about people after a while, and it's not just about lawyers and judges always making the decision. If I wasn't picked as a juror, I wouldn't be involved in this at all, but I was. I was asked to look at this situation for two months and then render a verdict with 11 other people, but how can you honestly do that when you feel that a very major part of this person's defense is missing? Would you have found them not guilty? Yeah. I under the law, under looking at those laws, a reasonable interpretation of those laws, in good conscience, I couldn't have found him guilty. Another juror was also outraged. Jolene D'Ambrosio, forewoman of the jury, has since written a letter of protest to the judge, a letter that has somehow become public. I think our verdict is worthless. I mean, I don't know what you could hold that verdict up to stand for. Part of their defense was 
they relied on spiritual healing because that's what they believe in by way of religion. But the other part of their defense, and the more important part of their defense, I think to us it would have been the more important part of their defense, was that there was a law that he turned to that said that this was considered proper physical care in Massachusetts. That was part of his defense. And he wasn't allowed to present that in the courtroom. If you'd known about that law, you would have presented a different verdict yourself. My verdict would have been not guilty, and you would have never gotten me to change it. Do you still believe in American justice, Jolene? I don't believe that American justice is going on in every courtroom that's hearing a trial anymore. No, I don't. I am... Um, you changed your views? Oh, yeah, I've changed my views. I used to be... Um, I used to really be pro-capital punishment, 100%. I had no misgivings. I had... Um, and I'm now, I'm no longer confident enough in these guilty verdicts to be willing to condemn, condemn someone to death because they were found guilty because I'm no longer sure how they were found guilty. I'm just not as sure as I was before. I believe there is justice. Do I believe it's all justice? No, not at all. This issue touches on something fundamental in America. The First Amendment to the Constitution set out here in stone in front of Boston's courthouse. And it reads, Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. It was, after all, why the Founding Fathers came to America in the first place. But now, Christian scientists believe that this child's verdict puts their rights under the First Amendment under threat. It isn't as though this was a matter of a fringe cult, an eccentric new philosophy sprung from drug taking or the deserts of California. The Church of Christ Scientist has a long, respectable and respected place in American life, and a wealthy one too. Its impressive new headquarters in Boston, three buildings by architect I.M. Pei, cost $75 million. Its prestigious newspaper, the Christian Science Monitor, has a circulation of 160,000. It has its own 30-minute show on Boston's television and recently invested $200 million in further media expansion. And yet, the following isn't what it was. 120 Christian Science churches have closed in America since February 1987. 1,800 now remain. In the last two years, there have been five prosecutions in such cases, Cases where children given spiritual rather than medical healing have died. Time to consult an expert in America's law and its constitution about whether the First Amendment, as it applies to Christian scientists, is being broken. They certainly are being challenged, um, but uh, what one learns very quickly when one studies American constitutional law th is that it is a doctrine not of absolutes, but of the balancing of important values one against the other. Uh, there's no question but that First Amendment rights uh, are among the most important and most highly protected rights in this country. They include rights of free speech, freedom of the press, as well as the free exercise of religion. Nonetheless, they can be outweighed uh, in cases of sufficiently compelling state interests under circumstances where uh, the government tries to um, uh, accomplish those interests uh, by the least restrictive means possible. But do you see that campaign then as a challenge to the freedom of religion in this country? I do in a sense. Uh, the constitutional issue to us is very important because we are talking about the freedom of religion. We're talking about the free exercise of religion. One can say that uh, you have the right to believe what you want to believe, but not to practice what you may want to practice. Well, we can't just wipe out the First Amendment. Well, there is no question in my mind that this entire case was a religious persecution. Um, it, was, it was going back like to the old heresy trials, for heaven's sake. Um, the government made a decision to put this religion on trial. The system of law, which I believe in so, so deeply, the reason I became to, the reason I decided to become a lawyer, all of my core values were really ripped asunder. I, I, I just, um, I couldn't believe that what I had participated in for four years came to such injustice. What about other messages coming from that trial? 
that the First Amendment is threatened, that the exercise of your religion has now got qualifying clauses added to it? Good Lord, no. This is a celebration of the First Amendment. The First Amendment is a, is a fundamental tenet that we believe in that uh, accommodates all of our views. It's like, a, it's like the American melting pot. Our values are found there, and our values include both the freedom to believe and the protection of children. This is, a, this is a wonderful verdict to celebrate the First Amendment. This is not restrictive on anyone's religion. It's just a restatement of the law that you may believe as you wish, but when your child is at risk of death, you better make sure that you use all available means, including medical science and including prayer, if you so wish. Could it be seen as saying, if your child is at the risk of death, then you must ditch your religion and look after your child first? It depends on what your religion is. If we go to the, the lunatic fringe, and I'm certainly not talking about the well-respected Christian Science Church, but if we were to use an extreme example of someone who believed in the value of poisonous snakes, and that one became ill, you toss the patient into a, uh, a pit full of snakes. Is that religion? Even if sincerely held? Well, maybe, maybe it is, but the point is, you can't do that. You can't do it to a child. So when you ask the general philosophical question, is there a, an inhibition of religious practice uh, in the extreme? Certainly. But within mainstream America, uh, with, which is a wide latitude of practice and belief, the First Amendment uh, to this day protects that freedom of belief and it protects children. If it's Christian scientists today, I always say, is it the Buddhists tomorrow? Is it the Muslims the next day? Is it the Jews the next day? Who's next? If someone can say, in the position of a district attorney, um, you can't do this anymore. Why? Because I say so. Well, who's going to tell me next? Am I not allowed to have uh, my children fast on the Day of Atonement? Are, are the Muslims not allowed to have children fast during the Feast of Ramadan? Um, are, is someone, a Catholic, not going to be able to have their children take communion because some germs may be passed? I don't know. I don't know. And the Christian scientists believe they're being persecuted, but no one, certainly not the prosecution, intends to prevent anyone of mature and pious judgment following their faith to the letter, trusting in spiritual healing totally, following what they see as Christ's example in denying themselves all medical aid. And if their healing fails, their right to their own death is not challenged. What the law seeks to do is protect children, those born into Christian science families but not mature enough to decide for themselves the religion they follow. This is an affront to the Twitchells, David and Ginger faced 20 years in prison. Instead, they were given 10 years probation and their three other children required to have regular medical checkups. It is this provision that outrages them? It is why they will appeal. The basic premise, I believe, of the prosecution is that, yes, you can turn to prayer, but you can't turn to it for anything serious because it doesn't really work. It doesn't, you can't use it for something serious, something physical, because it's only good for psychosomatic problems. If I believed that, I would turn to medicine. If my experience had shown me that, I would turn to medicine. So in that sense, I'm in agreement with the prosecution, except with their basic premise that prayer is just a nicety that you use if medicine isn't working or to support backup medicine. Prayer for us is the first, the best system of care. And if it wasn't, we wouldn't use it. The fact that a Christian science child has died, as in our case, does not mean that most Christian science have lived because of prayer, because of God. Do you privately think your prayers weren't strong enough? The way I relate to that question is, if Christ Jesus were there, our child would have lived. And I'm sure, uh, many other people through the centuries of great faith could have healed him. Uh, and we were not able to save him. Uh, I don't know if it was specifically my fault that the problem occurred, but I, in that sense, I'm sure a greater faith could have saved him. Mary Baker Eddy lived until her 90th year and is buried here in Boston. The early years of unspecified suffering behind her 
she became the commanding leader of a devoted church. Ginger and David Twitchell are among its devoted followers. Their faith has cost them the life of their child. It's worth asking whether that is as Christ or Mary Baker Eddy would have wished it. Thank you.